Hello everyone and welcome to another STAT 437 lecture video. In today's video we are going to be talking about how to use logistic regression to fit what we call a proportional odds model. And so in particular when we've been in discussing discrete time survival analysis we saw how the hazard ratio could sort of be used to or the hazard function could be used to uh, derive a likelihood analysis that looks a lot like uh, binomial likelihood. And so that sort of hints to us that maybe we can exploit something like logistic regression in order to fit models for the hazard functions in discrete time uh, survival analysis. And so when we do that, we're actually going to be fitting what we call proportional odds models. And these proportional odds models, they're quite powerful. They're sort of the main tool that we're going to be using for discrete time uh, survival analysis. And so today we're going to talk conceptually, what is the idea with these proportional odds models? And then in the next video, we'll actually sort of do a hands-on explanation of it. So mostly this is just building from the results that we've seen uh, so far. And hopefully we can sort of clarify anything that's been unclear uh, by going through the details here today. So the general idea is that we want to use logistic regression in order to uh, fit models, regression models, for uh, discrete time hazard functions. So this is all what we've seen in the past uh, lecture, right? So we saw that if we make these assumptions of conditionally independent and non-informative censoring, and so just to Recap, conditionally independent censoring happens whenever we can ignore the uh, conditional process, the Z process in this probability term here, right? And so if we can drop the uh, condition on Z, then that's conditionally independent. And then non-informative means that the parameter responsible for parameterizing this probability term here is independent of the parameter that uh, parameterizes the censoring process. Right? And so what we had seen or what we had argued was that this conditionally independent condition is really quite important, where this non-informative censoring is less important for it to be accurate, but it helps uh, improve the efficiency. So if we have these assumptions, then we can get this nice looking likelihood here where um, this should be a product over all individuals in the second one as well, but each uh, individual has this hazard ratio raised to the power of yis, which is just some binary indicator. And then we take one minus the hazard ratio, raise it to the power of one minus yis. And what I had said was that this, if you treat this hi term here as the probability of something happening, which it is in the discrete case, the hazard ratio is exactly a probability, then this is just a uh, binary or binomial likelihood, right? And so, that's essentially going to be the argument that we make. This is just binomial likelihood where probabilities are given by hi, where we're parameterizing it with theta. And so the basic premise is if we fit some sort of parametric structure for what that probability looks like, then we can exploit this likelihood process in order to get estimates out of it. So how can we fit uh, discrete time survival data using GLMs. The essential premise is that we're going to take that parametric model that we've been talking about for H to be a logistic regression model, right? So if we take the logit of H to be uh, this model that I'll clarify in a little bit more detail here, well, this is just a logistic regression model. And so what is it that we're actually looking at here? Well, the idea is that DJ is going to be a categorical time period variable. Right, so D1 is going to be one if we're in time period one, D2 is a one if we're in time period two, up to DCI, which is the maximum time period we look at. And so essentially what we're saying is that in any time period here, we have some alpha term that corresponds to the logistic probability of uh, the hazard in that time period. And so this model right here, while we're framing it through logistic regression is essentially saying in each hazard or in each time period, we're going to assume that there's some constant hazard, but that hazard can change over each of the time periods, right? And that's how we get this with all of these different uh, 
these different coefficients here. Now notice there is no intercept here, and that's because that would correspond to sort of the time period zero. We'd be over-parameterized in that, in that uh, situation. But here, you can see that we can just sort of uniquely fit a different hazard for each time period, right? So if we specify this logistic regression model, then that sort of forms the basis uh, for using GLMs in this situation. So we saw in the past lecture, we saw that you can sort of frame your data as either being person level or person period, right? And if you have it in person level, then we have one row for each person. But if you have it in Pearson period, then each person gets one row for every time period that they were still in the data set. And the outcome there is a zero or a one, where one indicates that the event happened and a zero indicates that it did not happen, right? And so if you expand the data out into person period format, then this model that we have here can sort of just be fit because each person has either a one or a zero as their outcome, or each person period has a one or a zero as the outcome. And it's just going to take one of those DIs being a one, right? And so in R, the essential code that we're going to be able to fit is if you uh, have a data frame where your event indicator, the one if it, the event happens in a zero otherwise, is stored in Y, well then what we can do is just fit this model where we have negative one to remove the intercept plus the factor variable of time. And if we fit this, then we're fitting the exact likelihood expression that we've been uh, seeing before, right? And so it becomes this really easy model for us to fit and for us to work with, and we sort of understand implicitly how to work with this kind of model. So some benefits. This technique allows us to do standard GLM inference, right? Everything that we can do based on inference from a GLM, we can do in this situation. And that's really powerful, right? We have a lot of tools. We've uh, you know, built out our technology for working with GLMs, and that all will still come to bear in this setting. We can also um, translate directly back to our hazard functions and then have a, the corresponding confidence intervals because again, we're just transforming the maximum likelihood estimates, right? And so the hazard at each time period T is just the X bit of the corresponding coefficient. And then we would have a standard error for that co corresponding coefficient. And so we can you know, make a 95% confidence interval. You can do a hypothesis test you can do a test of, of equality, all of the stuff that we're used to being able to do. In order to test for equality, it corresponds to this interesting hypothesis test, which is that the hazard is equal at two different time points, for instance, right? So if you test the hypothesis that two coefficients are equal, which is something that we can do in a GLM context, then we're testing this you know, real life notion of the hazard being the same at two time points. And this is a scientifically interesting uh, quantity to test because the hazard being equal at two different time points sort of tells you that your risk of event happening is equal at those time points, right? So we're thinking about the hazard as the instantaneous risk of the event happening, supposing you've survived till this time point. And if you know that at time t and at time t plus one, your hazards are the same, then that tells you something interesting about the underlying process. Because it's a maximum likelihood estimator, we can do MLE type inference, which includes likelihood ratio testing, uh, includes sort of all of the wall type asymptotic analysis that we're used to doing. We also know that it's gonna be highly efficient. And it also allows us to estimate the survivor function, right? And we did see this as well, but the survivor function is given by this uh, relationship to the hazard function. And so if we have an estimate for the hazard function through this x bit function up here, well, then we can get uh, a corresponding estimate for the survivor function. And that's going to work out quite nicely for us as well, because the survivor function is, uh, is obviously of, of significant interest for us. And so that sort of brings us to this idea of talking about the survivor function inference. Okay. And we saw a little bit about this, um, but it's worth uh, sort of talking in, in more detail here, right? We saw that you can estimate the uh, confidence intervals around the survivor function through the use of that uh, sort of four-step procedure where you consider a log transformation. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing in the proportional odds model here, right? So in general, 
the process that we're using relies on the multivariate delta method. Uh, and specifically, we're working from the log transform to apply this. Now, as I was emphasizing in the previous lecture, you don't actually need to understand all of the math that's going on here. There's actually sort of a lot of mathematical machinery that's underlying uh, everything that we're doing here. But the basic premise is that the variance of the log transform of a survivor function takes on this nice form here, where we have this G matrix, which is estimable for us. The variance here, where the variance is going to be that variance in the logistic regression setting, and then we have the G matrix transposed, right? And so as long as we have an estimate for all of those quantities, well, then we can estimate the variance of the log transform. And if we have an estimate for the variance of the log transform, then we can transform those estimates back, right? So the uh, general process is going to be that we get the variance from our GLM fit, right? We, we, that's a property that we're used to working with is the, the variance on those alpha parameters. And this G matrix is this upper triangle, triangular matrix here, or lower triangular matrix, sorry, where we essentially have in uh, corresponding columns, the different estimated hazards. And so it's gonna go up to be uh, a C, C different columns in this. And each of them, uh, we're going to go first with the hazard just at time one, and then the hazard at times one and two, and then one, two, three, and, and so on, right? And then we take the negation. And, uh, you know, if you're used to thinking about the delta method, well, this is coming out of a, a derivative of our transform there. So that's sort of where this is all uh, coming from. But in general, if you just take this form of the matrix to be given, well, then we have the estimates for the variance. We have the estimates for this G matrix. And so we can get an estimate of the overall variance. And then we can build out a confidence interval for the survivor function itself by taking the exponential transformation of this, right? So inside of here, inside of our exponential, we have the log of the survivor function, which is what we've been working with. And then we just use a standard normal likelihood here or a normal confidence interval here where we take our Z score, multiply it by the standard error, which we're taking out of that estimated matrix, right? It's the JJ element. And then if we exponentiate the whole thing, that's going to give us a confidence interval for the survivor function on the regular scale. Now, all of this relies on some asymptotic arguments, right? So it's not always going to work out sort of perfectly for us, but this is a fairly useful procedure and it allows us to uh, do inference on the level of the survivor function, even though primarily we're working with the hazard functions. Okay. So all of this has sort of been building up to the proportional odds model. That's what we've been talking about this whole time, but we can dive into a little bit more detail for the proportional odds model itself. And the idea here is that so far we've just been using indicator variables of time, but what if we wanted to let the hazard differ based on a set of covariates, right? So we've said the hazard's constant in each interval, but it's constant regardless of anything else that we know about the individual. And so instead, we could suppose that we're looking at uh, this slightly altered model here, right? So we have first all of these alpha parameters still, but then what we add on is this linear uh, component, this linear predictor here, where Xi is going to have whatever variates that we care about. Beta is another regression coefficient, okay? And so the idea is we still have a different uh, hazard for each of the intervals based on this first component here, but then we allow that to also be mediated by the coefficients that we care about, right? So this is sort of the natural way of extending this. So suppose that we're considering something like Xi being just a sex indicator, so it's a binary indicator. And so then when we include it in the model here, what we have is we have all of our time indicators, D1 through DCI, and then we also have our sex binary indicator with this beta term here, right? And so this is sort of a fairly, fairly standard model and we can sort of ask ourselves what happens with it, right? And so if you wanted to know what is the uh, difference between uh, a individual, a female individual and a male individual in this model, right? So if we take the logit where uh, at the same time point, we're looking at someone who is female with this beta term included, and then we subtract off the logit when uh, the person is male, so there's no beta term there, right? You can see that 
of course, it's just going to cancel out. We're just going to be left with beta. And so this is the same for every time point, right? The time point does not matter. If you're comparing two individuals, it's always going to be just this beta. And so the odds ratio that we're talking about is given by this exponential of beta, right? No matter what. And so that's why we call it the proportional odds model, since the odds will only differ by a constant multiplicative constant, and so they're always proportional, right? And you could think about doing this with a continuous variant where you'd have the same sort of effect with a, with a unit step size of one if you're assuming a linear effect, uh, that kind of thing, right? But the idea is that with this model, as long as we're willing to assume that the odds are always proportional, that they always differ by the same multiplicative constant, then this proportional odds model is going to help us do all of the modeling that we need. The nice part is that we actually don't need to take on faith that this model works, right? We can test the proportional odds assumption because we're working in this context of GLMs, which is, uh, you know, a place that we're, we're quite used to, to working within, right? And so one way that we can think about testing the validity of the proportional odds model is by fitting this heavily saturated model here, right? So if we include not only the original piece that we had talked about, but then also we include interactions between sex and every time point, except for one, right? If you included the interaction between sex and D1, then you're gonna have sort of an overspecified model there, but you include all of the others as well. Well, then this model is sort of a superset of the proportional odds one that we care about. And so we could take this as sort of our full model and test against that model whether the proportional odds assumption seems valid, right? And that's just going to be this test of beta 2 equals beta 3 equals up to beta c, all of them being uh, exactly zero. And so we can just do this as a nested likelihood ratio test because, again, we're in this really nice situation wherein uh, we have all of our likelihood procedures uh, available to us. So, in summary, the likelihood for a, a discrete time survival analysis using the hazard ratio ends up sort of giving off this binomial representation, which leads us to think about trying to use a GLM for it. We can model the hazard function using logistic regression. And what we're doing there is we're really just including those factor variables uh, for the time. And then that lets it vary over time. We can, of course, also extend that out to be a proportional odds model, uh, which we'll uh, recap after reminding that the survivor function can be estimated through the cumulative product uh, of one minus the hazard. And then we can do inference with that as well. And standard inference is, is applying to the hazard function because that's just sort of a natural transformation of the parameters. And with a little bit more work, we can also get standard inference for the multivariate or for the survivor function through the multivariate delta method. The inclusion of variates we typically will do through the proportional odds assumption, which uh, we can validate through the use of deviance tests inside of our GLM framework, right? And so um, that proportional odds assumption, it's one that we don't necessarily have to make, but that we really like because it sort of makes this nice parsimonious model where we let the hazard differ based on time, and then it scales based on our covariates that we care about. Okay. And so that's essentially everything that I wanted to discuss for uh, the discrete time survival analysis, at least from a conceptual standpoint. So in the le next lecture, we'll take a look at doing all of this inside of R with a real data set. We'll see how do we fit those GLMs. I'm not going to dig into the theory anymore here because there wasn't really any new theory presented. We just sort of took that likelihood representation that we had seen and then expanded upon it, right? And so, you know, if the last lecture where we talked about theory was a little bit confusing, maybe now with the with the uh, understanding of how we exploit that likelihood structure, it will go a, long, uh, a ways to helping you understand what we did there. But again, as long as we're willing to make those simplifying assumptions, so the uh, conditionally independent and the non-informative non censoring, then we get this really nice way of just using our standard GLM technology to fit these survival models. All right, so hopefully that all made sense. Uh, if you have any questions, as always, please reach out to me and ask. And if not, I will see you all in the next lecture.